If you have a Bible, would you turn to the book of Romans? The book of Romans, chapter 15. Our text will be verse 32, but we're going to read 30, 31, and 32. Amen? Amen. If you have it, would you say amen? Oh, come on, let's sit alone. I'm, I'm sure some people are still looking for it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. In the New Testament, in my Bible, it's page uh, 1,263. Romans 15. We're going to begin at verse 30. We are in the series, concluding the series, on refreshing. The refreshing of the Lord. The first message that we preached was times of refreshing. And remember that what that was, that was turning away from and turning to God. Last week was the refreshed. And what was that? That was people who are refreshed because they refresh others. And so today we're going to deal with a completely different uh, dynamic of the refreshing of the Lord. And I believe God is going to speak to all of us mightily and powerfully. So one more time, if you have Romans chapter 15 and verse 30, say amen. 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 Romans 15, 30. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. And verse 32, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy. Everybody say joy. 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 I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. God, I thank you that your word is powerful. I thank you that it's life. I thank you that it has glory in it. And Father, I ask that the glory that's awaiting your word and the glory that's inside of your word would be made manifest in the lives of your people. And God, I ask and I pray that what they receive today will be seed that turns into a harvest in their life and that they'll know and they'll live in the refreshing that comes from the kingdom of God and that they'll be able to take that message and give it to somebody else. And God, as always, I ask that it's you who anoints me and speaks through me in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen and amen. Go ahead, look at your neighbor and tell them shared refreshment and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's look at our text one more time. Verse 32. So that by God's will, I may come to you with joy. That's important. And together with you, be refreshed. The book of Romans is written by Paul the Apostle. Those who come from a liturgical background might call him St. Paul or St. Paul the Apostle. And he writes this letter to the Roman church somewhere, theologians and historians say, somewhere between 55 and 57 A.D. Now for those who say, what does A.D. mean? It is Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. He writes it in 55 to 57 A.D., which is some 22 to 24 years later and after the time of Jesus. Most theologians believe that Paul wrote the book of Romans not in Rome or not in Jerusalem, but in a town or a city called Corinth. Now, Corinth was a major city in the country of Greece. Everybody say Greece. 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 So while he's there in Greece, while he's there in Corinth preaching, he begins to write and he begins to pen this letter to the Romans. And so Paul, who's called with a different assignment, he's called to a different ministry than, say, John and, and Peter, he's called to the Gentile nation. Now, what's the Gentile nation? The Gentile nation are those who are not Jews. So anybody who's not a Jew is known and called to be a Gentile. We, unless you have Jewish heritage and Jewish background and Hebrew background, you are, we are Gentiles. So whenever you see Gentiles in the New Testament or David writes about the Gentiles, you say, hey, that's me. He's talking about me right there. Paul focuses his efforts on the Gentiles as, and the Gentile nation as his desire was to preach Christ where Christ was not known. He says, this is where I'm at. This is my focus. This is what really uh, fuels my fire. This is what uh, gets my juices flowing. I want to preach to nations that have never heard about Jesus Christ. 
I've been called. I've been anointed. I've been appointed to open my mouth, Paul says, and to utter and to declare the message of Jesus to those who have never heard him before. And so he sets out and he sails out and he begins to preach in nations and lands that have never heard of Christ before. They've never heard that specific name attributed to his character and person before. And he begins to tell them the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tells them that Jesus did come and this Jesus Christ did die and this Jesus Christ did bleed and suffer. But more importantly than all of that, he rose again and he rose again triumphantly and the same life that he had is the same life that he wants to give to you. And so he takes that message and he takes that gospel to all the Gentiles in the regions that he went to go preach in. And so he writes to the Romans. Everybody say Romans. Romans. He writes to the Romans to share his heart and his sentiment with them regarding his concerns. What does he tell them in, in Romans? What does he tell them in this chapter? He tells them this. He says, I desperately want to see you when I'm going on my way to Spain. Now, a lot of times we, we read the Bible, and we, we keep it in the, in the nation and the land of Israel. But he was in, indefinitely going and trying to get to the nation and the land and the country of Spain. And he says, no, while I'm going there and while I'm traveling to that place, I want to see you. I have a message to give you. I have something to share with you. He has a desire and he has a longing to be with these Romans that he might impart some spiritual gift to them. He said, I have to get there. I have to get to you Romans. And yes, like I said, probably it was maybe like last year, I realized that the same Romans was the same Roman Italy where they eat carbonara and fettuccine Alfredo. I said, that's the same one. Oh, my goodness. And he, God says, I have, a, I have a message for you, Paul, and I want you to give it to the Romans. And Paul says, I have something to tell you and I have something to give you. There's something inside of me. There's a gift inside of me that I have to release to you. There's something that is active. There's something that's tangible. There's something that's innate inside of my person and my character. It's beckoning on the inside of me. It's knocking at the door of my heart and I have to release it and I have to give it to you. There's a spiritual gifting. There's a spiritual reality that I have to give to these Romans. And day after day after day after night after night, I only long to and I only dream of releasing what's on the inside of me and I got to get it to you. Ever felt in your life that there's something inside of you that you just got to give to somebody else? There's just a gift on the inside of you that you got to give to somebody else. There's a word inside of your mouth that you just got to give to somebody else and it's like a fire as Jeremiah said that shut up in your bones and it's killing you every single day that you can't release that word. That's exactly what Paul was feeling. That's exactly what Paul's uh, sentiment was. He said, I have something for these people and I've got to get it to them. But he tells them this in the letter. He says, but before I can get to you, there's some activity that I have to engage in. There's some things that I have to accomplish. There's some uh, details that I have to finish. I have to leave the place where I'm at, which was more than likely Corinth. And I have to take what I have and I have to take it to Jerusalem. What was on the inside of him? What did he possess materially and monetarily? He possessed a financial gift that he was going to give to the people in Jerusalem. He said that there are people in Macedonia and there are people in other countries who have given to the people of Jerusalem and I have something that I have to give to them. I have to make my way to Jerusalem. I have to make my way to them because there's a gift waiting them that I have to put in their hand. That's a, a spiritual dynamic and principle of the kingdom. And we actually touched on it last week. The principle and the dynamic of giving. And God says that if you give to somebody, I'm going to give to you. If you bless somebody, I'm going to bless you. When you take what's in your hand and you take what's in your pocket and you give it to somebody in need, I will bless your life because you moved in obedience and subservience to me and to my word. And whenever you open your mouth and whenever that you open your pocket and give to somebody who needed something, I will give you something that you've never had before. 
And so the church that's growing begins to give to the people and the church that's in Jerusalem. And Paul says, I got to get there before I can see you so I can give them what other nations have given unto them. But we have a problem here and we have a situation here because Paul knew. Everybody say Paul knew. Paul knew that when he gets to Jerusalem, there's going to be an issue. He knows there's going to be a problem. He knows there's going to be a scenario that is plaguing his life and will plague his life that he's going to need some serious activity in the spirit on. He knew that when he trekked through Jerusalem and his feet touched that soil, he was going to be faced with opposition. He knew he was going to be faced with uh, 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 people coming against him. He knew that there were going to be people and religious leaders of that day who were going to absolutely try to destroy him and preach as he may and give as he may. It didn't matter what he was going to do. Those people were iron set and iron clad and fully focused on destroying him and his ministry and where he was going. And Paul says this, when I get there. When I begin to travel, as I begin to trek through, I'm going to need something from you, you Romans. I'm going to need your prayer. I'm going to need your opening of your mouth and crying out to God for me. I'm going to need some intercession. I'm going to need some glory being manifested in somebody's home and having them call unto God for my safety and for my protection. Because if I don't get it and if you don't open your mouth and you don't pray, I probably more than likely am going to have to suffer an incredible punishment, an incredible abuse, an incredible lashing from the people that I go to see because these followers of Judaism and these Hebraic leaders are coming against me and they want to destroy me. Why? Because they don't want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they don't want to know that there was a God who came and who bled and who suffered and who died. They didn't want to know that there was a God who worked miracles and signs and wonders. They rejected the message that he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. They didn't want to hear him say that I am the I am. I am the one who's responsible the father of Abraham I am the one who walks and who is uh, in charge and orchestrates all of nature and who's responsible for the activity in the atmosphere they didn't want to hear that because they weren't waiting for that Jesus they were waiting for another one and if somebody was going to come in and preach that Jesus they wanted to destroy him and his message and so Paul says when I get there we say get there When I get there, I know exactly what I'm going to encounter. He knew there was going to be opposition. He knew there was going to be conflict. He knew there was going to be havoc. He knew he was going to have to stand in the face of religious leaders and continue and continue and continue to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to every single person who was watching him and every single person that was waiting and listening. Imagine just for a moment what it would be like to be Paul. Imagine what it would be like to know that you're going to leave a place and a town of people who love you. And you're going to move into a place and a town and a city of people who hate you. Imagine what your mind would be thinking. Imagine what your heart will be feeling. Imagine what your spirit will be going through knowing that the place that God is sending you seems to be a place of impending and imposing destruction. Imagine the fear, imagine the terror, imagine the worry, and he has no other recourse and he has no other option but to ask these Romans, you got to pray for me. I know that there's something significant about prayer. I know that there's something real about prayer. I know that when somebody calls upon and calls unto the Lord, that the Lord will hear them and the Lord will answer them and that the Lord will deliver them. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord, my favorite verse in the Bible, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. That tells you that God hears. That tells you that God answers. That tells you that God responds. He said, call unto me in the day of trouble and I'll answer to you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you do not know. 
believe God says, call me, talk to me, speak to me, and watch me be God all up in your life. Watch me be the deliverer. Watch me be the savior. Watch me be the sanctifier. Watch me be the God who answers all of your prayer because you chose not to keep your mouth closed, but you chose to stand up, put your shoulders back, open your mouth, and call unto me because you know that I'm God. And apart from me, there is no other. And so Paul says this, he says, Romans, I need you to pray for me because it's trouble on the other side. There's disaster on the other side. There's destruction on the other side. There's impending death for me on the other side because I'm choosing to open my mouth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the same death and the same manner of destruction that they're going to do, that they tried to do to Jesus will be the same thing that they're going to try to do to me. And so I need you right now. I need you to intercede right now. I need you to pray right now. Paul said, I need somebody to get on their knees and put their face in the dirt and begin to pray for me. Because without your prayer, I won't be able to move forward. Without your prayer, I won't be able to complete this assignment. Without your prayer, I won't be able to fully, freely be emboldened and open my mouth and declare the good news and the message of Jesus. Paul says, I need your prayer and I need it now. Let me tell you something, saints of God. There is power in prayer there's glory in prayer there's manifestation in prayer and God says if you pray to me and if you call to me I will hear you and I'll answer your prayer let me just encourage you this is not a part of my message but let me just say this right now God wants you and he wants me to begin to pray the Bible says to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all manner of supplement and request. You can pray to God whenever you want to, whenever you need to. In your darkest moment, pray. In your most scary moment, pray. When you feel like everything is destruction, pray. When you feel like disaster is all around you, pray. When you feel like you're sick in your body and you're not going to be well, pray. When you feel depressed, pray. When you feel sad, pray. When you feel oppressed, pray. When the enemy comes in, pray. Because when you pray, the spirit of the Lord will will raise a standard against him and you will see the manifestation power of prayer in your life. So let me just tell you one more time. Pray. pray. The third thing, everybody say the third thing. Pray. The third thing and the last thing that he asked them to do is he asks for prayer again. Why? Not to be protected. He said, they already got that covered. They're going to pray for it. I'm going to be protected. The will of the Lord is going to be made known in the earth. And I'm going to achieve and accomplish my assignment. But I need you to pray so that I may come to you, Romans, with your pasta and all. With your garlic bread and all. That I might come to you with joy that I might come to you with a spirit of joy in me so that I don't come to you depressed I don't come to you waylaid I don't come to you bowed down I don't come to you broken I don't come to you sad but on the inside of me is a joy that was fueled by your prayer. There's a gladness that was fueled by your prayer. There's an overjoyed sensation inside of me because of something that took place outside of me. I'm waiting for your prayer. I'm awaiting your intercession. I'm awaiting your opening of your mouth to talk to God about Paul, the apostle who's bringing this gospel of Jesus to the known world. I need you, Paul says, to open your mouth and pray for me that I might come to you with joy, not not broken but with joy not but not not bemoaning but with joy because I have something to do when I get there and if the joy is not there then I cannot accomplish and achieve the assignment that God has placed on my life when I get to you so I need you to pray for me now so that when I get there then joy will be inside of me and joy will be alive inside of me and joy will be moving on the inside of my belly and the inside of my spirit and joy will fuel me to accomplish and achieve the assignment 
assignment that God has called me to do. I need you to pray for the joy that's inside of me right now because I need it to be filled and come alive by the power and the person of the Spirit of God. He says, so pray for me now because I need this joy. He wanted to make sure That he was coming to them with that gift. Because he knew that he was going to receive something from them. And he was going to give something to them. He said, I know that when I come to see you, I'm going to get something from you. I'm going to receive something from you. I'm going to receive something out of your spirit. You're going to release something to me when I get there. But not only that, when I get there and once I've received from you, then I'm going to give you something. So I need you to declare the joy that's living in me. Let me tell you something right now. Joy comes out of two ways. Three ways. The operation of the Spirit in your life as an independent work that He wants to do in you. The understanding, the realization that there is the joy of the Lord in you that you declare for yourself. But when you can't declare it for yourself because you seem to be fair, frail and you seem to be weak and you seem to be bow, bowed down and oppressed, then there's a joy that comes out of you and is manifested in your life because somebody prayed for you. You have an authority on the inside of your belly. You have an authority on the inside of your spirit to declare and to decree the gifting of the spirit and the activation of the spirit in your brother and in your sister. I don't ever want you to say, no, it's only Pastor Santino. No, it's only Pastor Rod Parsley on TV. No, it's only Bishop T.D. Jakes who can do these things. No, you are blood bought. You are blood washed. You are redeemed by the blood of the lamb and the same Holy Ghost that lives in every single preacher is the same Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of you and God says if you open your mouth you can begin to activate gifts on the inside of somebody that they need most when they're weak and they can't get up activate the gift that's on the inside of them when they cannot open their mouth and praise me activate the gift that's on the inside of them and when you do I'm going to hear you and when they call unto me I'm going to answer them and the gift that's in them will be made alive on the inside of their being and they'll come back to life by the power of the spirit of God because you prayed and because you opened your mouth and because I heard and because I answer he knew everybody say he knew Paul knew that there was an encouragement awaiting them when he arrived he said there's going to be an encouragement that's just for me There's going to be a gifting that's just for me. There's a specific activation of the life of the kingdom. There's a specific blessing in the realms and the confines of the kingdom. There's a specific activity and manifestation waiting for me, Paul says, because of what they're going to do for me. There's a gift that's awaiting me. Ever come to the place of Christmas time and you receive the most horrendous gift ever and you look at the gift and you say, that gift is not for me. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get that horrible white elephant gift. And you're like, oh. no, no. I, I see. See, when you grow up like we did, and you grow up in a Latin culture, you get bad gifts, and then you can get embarrassing gifts. You know, the, the bad gifts. I remember there was a story that's been told time and time again. Um, Deacon uh, Marcus Ortiz was a young guy and it was Christmas time I don't think I was born yet but because he, he's a little older than I am but still a handsome guy yeah. Yeah. I, I, when I was a kid I used, to, I used to look up to Marcus a lot I thought he was the coolest guy ever 
and he had this, he used to, um, he used to take this, this is, this is the 80s, right? And so, he, and so I know I'm dating him a little bit, but he used to take this grease, and he used to put in his hair, and he used to spike it up like this. <laughs> <laughs> I was about five or six years old, and, and uh, Marcus has different hair than I do. You know, I'm Italian, Puerto Rican, Nicaraguan, and so my hair is different than Marcus's, and I was a little guy. So my hair would just kind of part and wave, but Marcus was able to take his hair and just put it straight up. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> How do you do your hair like that? He's like, I don't know, I just do. You know? I thought he was, he was so cool. But before he was that age, and he was a little younger, uh, he received a gift, or his, his brother received a gift for Christmas. Now, mind you, music had changed by the 80s, and, and they opened up this album, and it wasn't the flavor of music that they were accustomed to. And these urban kids who grew up in the Bay Area in the 80s looked at the album cover and go, the Bee Gees? <laughs> You know, Saturday Night Fever and John Travolta and you know that the Bee Gees. <laughs> and he said, This gift is not for me. He's he's shaking his head right now, going, Yup. <laughs> you get the Bee Gees out, he said, That's not for me. You get the embarrassing gift like that big, humongous pack of 25 pair underwear when you're a little boy, and all your family goes, Uh-huh, very good. Uh-huh. And everybody's happy except you. <laughs> they say, no, we don't need them at school, so just use them. There's those gifts that you get that are not for you. But Paul says, there's a gift that's for me. There's a specific gift that, that's for me. Let me just tell this last story, and then I'm going to move, say something, say something, and then we're going to pray. You talk about a gift that's for you. Same man, same Deacus, same Marcus. Let's fast forward in some time. I believe it was Christmas or his birthday. And we're all at my, my, my aunt's house. And there was a gift from Marcus. And it was kind of a big box. And as, and as he took the box, he said, oh, this one's for me. And he began to unwrap it and unwrap it. And there was one box inside of another box, inside of another box, inside of another box. And it looked like one of those, you know, Ru Russian dolls, you know, the nesting dolls. And, and finally, he gets down to the last box. And an hour and a half later, he's pulling off that last piece of paper and that last ribbon. And he's looking at a, at a box that he doesn't know what's inside. And I'm looking there in anticipation, and everybody's there in the living room looking in anticipation, and as Marcus took the lid off of that box and revealed what was on the inside of that box. And he looked, and I saw his eyes go. And I looked, and I saw my own eyes go. Because on the inside of that box was the key to a Pontiac Trans Am. And everyone went, uh-huh. And Marcus said, that gift, that one's for me. It wasn't the Bee Gees album. It's the key to a Pontiac Trans Am. And everybody left, and he drove away. And, and, and I sat in, in the living room, looked out the window, and went, hopefully one day I'll have me a Trans Am. Marcus, Deacon Marcus said, that one is for me. And Paul said, there's a gift. That's for me. It's not the attack of sadness. It's not the attack of destruction on my life. It's not a feeling and, and an inner knowing of despondency and feeling like I'm left. No, there's a gift that's awaiting me. And when I get there, because you prayed me through, because you called me out, the gift that I'm going to walk into is the gift of refreshing. There's a refreshing that's coming to me when my feet move into that Italian royal soil. And when I get there and when I see you and when you see me, there's going to be an exchange of refreshing between the two of us. And I can't.
came by this morning to let you know that when the body of Christ gets together and brothers and sisters get together, there's an exchange of the refreshing of God to our lives because God said, if you come together, if you worship together, if you praise together, I'll release a gifting that's on the inside of you of refreshing that will only come when you guys become one in me. Everyone stand to your feet. There's a word in the Greek. I'm not going to say the word because it's extremely long. But there's a word in the Greek that is similar to the word or the phrase. Uh, uh, the verse says, uh, together refresh. That's the phrase, together refresh. But there's a word in the Greek that's similar to that Greek word here. And it means to come together as a dinner guest at a table. When you come together in the house of the Lord, when you come together in the presence of the Lord, you come to the table of the Lord and you gather together as family. And as you're there, God begins to refresh you because you found yourself in the family that God has assigned to you. Why do you think the spirit and the wind of God was in this house today like it was? Could that have happened if I was here by myself? No. Could that have happened if, if, if Gina was up here leading worship in this empty room all alone? No. If Pastor PT was in his office praying, would that have happened? No. It only happens when brothers and sisters come together in unity. And then God says, and now I will release a refreshing to you because that gift is awaiting inside of the person next to you and I will give you something absolutely brand new and you will take in that refreshing and you will take in that encouragement because you chose to have fellowship with your fellow brethren. I'm going to say this one thing and we're done. Paul said this in Romans 1. Now remember, this book of Romans is one whole letter to Italy. One whole letter to Rome. We break it up in chapters, but it was one whole entire letter. And in chapter 1, he says this, because this is important. He says that you and I may be, what? Mutually encouraged. That you and I may be mutually encouraged. As our wonderful pastor and founder taught us almost 21 gifts of the Spirit. It's the Greek word, sum parakaleo. When we come together, there is a mutual encouragement one to the other. And what you need, I have. And what I need, you have. And it only comes about when we come together and when we lock arms one to the other. Because there's a supernatural connection between brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we're one in Christ and the body of Christ comes together limb to limb, eyes to mouth, ears to nose, hands to feet. And what one needs, the other one gives. And so right here, right now, in this room, you have a gift, you have a blessing on the inside of you that your neighbor needs. There's a refreshing, just like this glass. We, we looked at it every single week. What does this glass do? What, is the, what does the water do? It quenches your thirst. When you're so hot, you feel like you're going to die in the desert of despair. It cools you down. When you're so thirsty, you feel and your, and your throat is so dry and you feel like you can't pray anymore. You feel like you can't worship anymore. The moment you come together with your sisters and your brothers, God releases a refreshing and it refreshes you and it cools you and it quenches your thirst. But it only happens when you come together with those who God has called to your family. So here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to point your hand to your neighbor. Just point it. Don't touch him. Don't touch him. Just point it. Look at the man and say this. You have something I need. 
And I have something you need. So in the name of Jesus, as we come together in the bond of unity, in Jesus' name, I release to you mutual encouragement. I release to you the blessing of joy to your life and a refreshing from God in your life now in the name of Jesus. Lift your hands in this room. Father, we thank you. Father, we glorify you. Father, we honor you. We magnify your name. We give you the praise. We thank you that you are the refresher. We thank you that you are the one who brings refreshment to our life, to our minds, to our soul, to our body, to our spirit. You bring healing to every single area of our life that needs it. You bring deliverance to every single area of our life that needs it. You bring sustainment to every part of our life that needs it. And we thank you for it right now. So God, I ask that you'll be that God to your people. I ask that you'll be that releaser of blessing to your people. And may they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that because they came into your house, because they had fellowship with your people and their family, that they received a refreshing that only came from you because they chose to obey you and they chose to worship you and glorify you and honor you. So, Father, I ask tonight, or today, excuse me, that you rest upon your people, that you remain among them, that you speak to them mightily, and that you give them a glory and a grace that only you can give. I speak it now in the name of Jesus. May it be yours and yours in abundance. And so now, today, this week, go. In the name of the Lord, go in the peace of the Lord. May God rest upon you. May God rest among you. May he, may his face shine on you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, for his glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. Go put your hands together in the presence of the Lord.